ago. 2015. Um, and then I moved back to the Midwest of Cincinnati now, and I came back just uh, like for fun to give the lecture. So that's if I wanted to. So I actually first took the PowerPoint from Anna Newfeld because then I thought I wouldn't have to make my own. Um, but she did, I don't know if you guys were here for it, she did the review maybe last year, maybe just like a year before that. Um, but she went kind of into, she did more of like an in-depth thing on a few topics. And I didn't really want to do it that way, so I still stole some of her stuff. So everything that looks like a really in-depth review is probably the older slides that you might have seen, but um, we'll see. Anyways, um, in terms of the neural off anatomy, you know, these, this, these topics come up under multiple different sections, right? Like plastics and peas and whatever. So you do have to know them. They always ask some questions about them. I'm not going to go through them because it's too boring and you wouldn't really learn it anyways. Um, but, uh, you know, you have, like, you have to know all of these and how they separate us. You do have to sit down and learn it. It's worth it. It will be worth at least a few questions for the OCAP. Um, what's inside the annulus is in, what's outside of it. What structures are within the cavernous sinus. Everybody knows this, right? But um, three, four, V1, V2 travel in the lateral wall. Six and the ICA are kind of within the meat of the cavernous sinus. Um, so they're more susceptible to traumatic injury. Uh, you have to know the sympathetic pathway. And most people pretty much know it enough to answer the questions, but for the Horner's questions and the parasympathetic pathway for cranial nerve three and eighties questions, you do have to know those. Um, I'm gonna go through a few imaging slides. On every OCAP that I took, they always had at least one imaging picture where it's basically like, what is this structure? Um, they will, I think they often give a stem with it, but pretty much the question is like, where is this structure? Um, so these will probably be more helpful for my, what year are you guys? Can everybody tell you, are you guys first, second, third? Uh, we're second years. Second uh, years, okay. Year. Intern. Intern, okay. What about you? Second, okay. So um, it's, <coughs> you know, like as, as you go along in your residency, it's gonna be easier and easier, but sometimes at the beginning, you haven't had a whole lot of experience picking out the structure for yourself on the scan, and so then when they ask, like, you know, they label it like, you know, what is this? You can be like, mm -hmm. So you guys have more, you have more neuroradiology as part of your residency than I did, but um, I still think it's helpful to review. So you need to know which one is the superior orbital fissure and which one is the optic canal. So the optic canal is more medial, right? The superior orbital fissure is a bit more lateral and inferior, but um, so you want to try to remember that. That's like a, that's a favorite one that they ask, like which one is the superior orbital fissure. Um, and this is it on the coronal CT. So optic canal is more medial, superior orbital fissure, uh, more infralateral. Uh, does anybody know what this one is? Superior ophthalmic vein, right? So if they give you a question that is related to this structure, it's almost, it's going to have something to do probably with the cavernous sinus. This stem will have something to do with that. But, um, but that is the superior ophthalmic vein. That's another favorite one that they like to ask. That's what it looks like on the coronal. So right underneath the superior rectus there. Um, these are some MR slices to show you where the cavernous sinus is. It's easy on the MR usually to pick out the cavernous sinus. Sometimes it's a little tougher like on the coronal CTs because it's not as well delineated, right? But the cavernous sinus is there and there. The ICA runs through it so you get like the, the flow void there um, that you can see and then the cavernous sinus is here. That. So they'll, they love to ask imaging questions about that. So if they show you a picture of a dilated superior ophthalmic vein like that, it will either be about a CC fistula or a CC thrombus probably. If the cavernous sinus is pretty opacified looking, like these are, if it looks diffusely opacified, it's gonna be a fistula. If it's not enhancing, it's gonna be a thrombus. 
Um, and this is a CT scan showing the cavernous sinus. So um, this is, these are, it's bilateral um, cavernous sinus thrombosis, but this is where it is on the CT scan. So I think the question, I think they asked on one of my OCAPs, it was a CT. With, it was a coronal CT, and they asked, like, where's the cavernous sinus? Uh, does anybody know what that structure is? It's the pineal gland, right? So the, do you guys know what syndrome happens with a tumor of the pineal gland? Yes, paranoxin, dorsal midbrain. So this is another um, thing <coughs> that they ask about. So the dorsal midbrain syndrome, paranoids is when, it's almost always due to a pineal gland tumor, 90% of the time. So if they ask you about it, it's gonna be related to that. Um, but does anyone remember any of the findings of it? So they get paresis of upcase, they don't look up, they get mid-dilated pupils, convergence, retraction, and nystagmus on attempted upcase, so the eyeball kind of pulls back because you get co-contraction of the muscle. They have light near dissociation and lid upper lid retraction. So that's a really easy one because it's very localizing, right? So they can give, describe these findings and then say like where is, like what structure will, would likely be abnormal or something like that. And that's, they will likely give it to you in a sagittal view. Um, oh, I could almost guarantee it'll be sagittal. What are the most common intraconal tumors? Does anybody know what are the top three? What's number one? Yes. What are the other two? Yes? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so this is a little table from the BCSC about differentiating between the optic nerve glioma and meningioma. Um, so I've got a few pictures here, but you guys can check out that um, chart. It's kind of helpful. But So we'll start with the optic nerve sheath meningioma. So this is an unplugged meningioma where it's just, just surrounding the optic nerve. So that's kind of the classic picture. This is an enhanced MRI. That's the tram track appearance. Um, so they will likely show you one like that. It can be expansed out, so it can just kind of look like a big globby thing. Um, but it won't enlarge the optic nerve. The other way that they may show it to you is showing calcifications on a CT. So that's an easy way to differentiate between glioma and nerve sheath meningioma is that there may be calcifications. Treatment if somebody has an optic nerve sheath meningioma. Does anybody know? So it's going to be observation versus maybe radiation. Um, so the typical picture is usually a woman, she's kind of mid, middle age, they, she'll get progressive proptosis with some vision loss probably over time, may have optic nerve pallor edema. You don't have to do anything about it unless they're losing vision and it's, it seems like it's extending back along the optic nerve because um, and it, you know, so basically we observe it unless it looks like it maybe is extending back and going to hit the other eye and then you can radiate. Um, and this is what a path slide might look like with the somoma bodies. Um, so kind of the, the whorls of spindle cells there. Um, this is a more representative picture of an optic nerve glioma. So it's the big Puji mass of the optic nerve. It's usually, they'll probably show you the fusiform enlargement and they usually will get some optic nerve kinking. So that's why I picked that picture. Um, the typical picture, right, in kids, like if they're less than 10, um, it's a low grade astrocytoma. So they usually will have vision loss with proptosis. May or may not be painful in a kid with strabismus, disc edema, or atrophy. Um, in kids, it's considered benign, basically, but there is somewhere around a 15% mortality rate, usually if, it, if the tumor extends back and is involving the hypothalamus, but it's like basically considered benign. Um, does anyone know the systemic condition it's associated with in kids? 10 to 50% of kids with an optic nerve glioma will have NF1. 
up. So that's an easy favor <coughs> to ask. In kids, the treatment is usually observation. You can surgically excise it if it's rapidly growing. Or you can do surgical excision plus minus radiation and chemotherapy. But that's usually like to preserve vision in the other eye or if it's, keep, if it's extending back to the chiasm. Um, in adults, this is glioblastoma and it's fatal usually within a year, like six to nine months, no matter what you do. And that's what the pathology will look like. This is for the kids. So as I said, it's a pil considered a pilocytic astrocytoma. Um, so you'll get round to spindle nuclei and then a fair number of Rosenthal fibers, um, which are the cigar-shaped eosinophilic ones. So that's for the optic nerve sheath meningioma with the tram track appearance. And that's for the optic nerve glioma. Uh, so this is the cavernous hemangioma. So the typical picture of this, again, it's going to be, they're going to describe a middle-aged woman with painless proptosis. So they usually don't really get vision loss with the cavernous hemangiomas most of the time. Um, so the, the picture will be a middle-aged woman who's, who's noticed this progressive painless proptosis. Sometimes they get double vision with it. Um, it's intraconal, it's well-defined because you have this like dark pseudo capsule on there. And then you get this progressive enhancement um, on a contrasted MRI that's usually fairly heterogeneous. But they'll show you something with a capsule. It'll look like that. So, you know, you can, you can see how you maybe would get tripped up with the appearance of an optic nerve glioma, but they'll show you one that's kinking the optic nerve. And then this one, what they're trying to show in this picture is that it's actually displacing the optic nerve here. So it's like displacing the structures in the medial rectus, but it's encapsulated there and it's going to slowly progressively enhance. And then the pathology, so you have these um, dilated vascular spaces that are filled with blood, right? It's like kind of a septated thing, but you know, if you see the blood, it's gonna be the big blue, right? I'm gonna show you blood in there, let's see, cavernous hemangioma. So the treatment is what? What do you do with the cavernous hemangioma? Yeah, surgical excision, if you have to, you can just leave them, but if they have, um, double vision from it, or they're getting really proptotic and have exposure, you can take them out. Okay, so you can get an anterior communicating artery aneurysm that results in a visual field defect because of where the anterior communicating artery travels relative to the optic nerve. So it's usually superior, that, that's for the anterior communicating is, so there's the chiasm with the prechiasmatic nerves running right there. Um, but the thing to remember about that is that it will usually result in an isolated inferior visual field defect because it's laying over top. So that's kind of the picture of how it lies. Uh, okay, so we'll talk quickly about dominant optic atrophy. So it starts in younger kids, so usually before 10. It's autosomal dominant. The picture is going to be slow, progressive loss of their central acuity that usually arrests around 2200, and they've got decreased color vision. They will have this wedge of temporal pallor, and on the visual field, they have the classic central or sepocentral scotoma. So that's the picture. It's sort of looking white out, but yeah, they'll show you one where you get this, the wedge of temporal pallor here. Um, does anyone know what the gene is that it's associated with? Because they will probably ask that. OPA1. OPA1. Yeah. That's the sequocentral um, visual field defect, which can sometimes look bitemporal. So you don't want to get thrown by that. They may show you one that looks like that, but keep that in mind. A sequocentral scotoma can mimic a bitemporal one. Laborers. They would definitely ask you a question about laborers. So it's the mitochondrial disease, kind of a similar presentation to dominant optic atrophy, but they're older. It's usually males. It's bilateral, but it may be sequential. Um, the picture of how the nerve looks 
in the beginning can be different, but later on it'll probably look pretty similar. So this is an earlier picture, or picture I guess I should say at the onset of the disease. So you get this classic triad in labors where you get circumpapillary telangiectasia on the surface of the disc. The disc looks swollen, but it's pseudoedema, so there's no leakage on the floor seam. So that's going to be the, the big clue. Like it looks swollen, but no leakage. That's a classic thing for labors. Okay, the systemic associations of labors. So you can get labors plus, where you have um, all, some of these other associated conditions. It's transmitted by female carriers, mitochondrial DNA mutation in the NADH complex. So there's the current, the genetic testing that's typically used will hit 90% of the mutations and it tests for these three. Um, the 11778 is the most common, but the 14484 has the best chance of some spontaneous improvement. So I, I would definitely know these things, the, the big points about the three different mutations because um, they may ask that, right? Which one do you definitely, should you definitely send for an EKG kind of thing? Um, yeah, so you want to make sure that you rule out cardiac arrhythmia. Okay, optic nerve drusen, so deposition of protein-like material in the optic nerve head. It's usually autosomal dominant, so examining the parents can be really helpful, but it, it can be sporadic. Um, they may show you, I remember seeing at least one path slide about this on um, the OCAPs of how the path is going to look with the, the basophilic acellular stuff mucopolysaccharide positive. Uh, what are the rare sequelae of optic nerve drusen? Can anybody let, tell me one? What sometimes happens with them? They're not always totally quiet and benign. Uh, so you can get neovascular membranes and hemorrhages, and if they compress the nerve enough, you can get a, a, an ischemic optic neuropathy. But peripapillary CNBM can be from drusen. What's the most common visual field defect from drusen? They can kind of do anything, but most common is infranasal. What imaging modalities can you use to visualize drusen? Ultrasound. Yes. What else? What? Yes. What else? CT. Okay, and what are the two systemic conditions that have a higher incidence of optic nerve drusen? This would be a very high yield question because they, they love asking stupid shit like this. Wow, who cares? But. Yes, and red night is pigmentosa. Okay, so we'll talk briefly about the toxic or nutritional deficiencies. So, uh, you know, the presentation is going to be fairly similar to the other, um, like the inherited optic neuropathies, right? Where you get, usually it's a bilateral progressive <coughs> loss of color vision, perhaps central acuity with a sequocentral visual field defect. Um, vitamin B12 deficiency is the vitamin deficiency that's most likely to cause the issue. Usually it's in people who are drinking a lot of alcohol, they're replacing their calories with the alcohol, or they've had bariatric surgery. So if they give you any stem about bariatric surgery, you almost guarantee it's going to be like a vitamin deficiency thing. Um, remember from the days when we were real doctors that B12 deficiency can result in that stocking and glove distribution of the peripheral neuropathy, so they could describe it that way. Um, ethanol and methanol can do the same thing. Ethambutol, isoniazid, rifamp, and the treatment for TB um, can result in it. It's a dose-dependent thing, so the higher the dosage, the more likely you are to have to get it. Um, usually, the discs, they'll just present it as a pale disc, but initially they can have some disc hyperemia. It's pretty rare to have actual disc swelling. And then you definitely need to remember about the amiodarone toxicity. So most people on amiodarone 
will get the vortex keratopathy, only 2% get an optic neuropathy. Two-thirds of the time, it's bilateral. So if they're presenting somebody that looks kind of like an NAION picture, but they don't have a disc at risk, um, and it's an insidious progressive onset uh, that they may be talking about. Uh, AION, pro we probably don't even really have to do this review because everybody knows this stuff. Um, but they'll probably ask, they'll probably present like a typical NAION picture and then ask like what's the appropriate management. So, you know, for a typical NAION picture, you're going to, they'll say that it's a disc at risk, right? You need to have that, some sectoral pallor. Usually they'll show an altitudinal field defect with it. Um, you need to think about uh, phosphodiesterase, 5 inhibitors, and amiodarone, but um, the treatment is basically a complete physical evaluation to look for microvascular risk factors. So, you know, like checking blood pressure, lipids, glucose, like the A1C, a sleep study, and avoiding um, blood pressure medications at night. Okay, that's that's going to be the treatment. So some version of like a microvascular risk factor assessment um, is how they'll probably ask for it. And for GCA-related ischemic optic neuropathy, um, you know, it's usually somebody that's older, so older than 55, but usually older, older. Um, associated with polymyalgia rheumatica, so that they will get pain in the shoulder and hip girdles. Um, and then, of course, everybody knows the other typical symptoms of GCA. I'm not going to say it. Uh, if they show a picture with pallid edema or a bunch of disc hemorrhages, um, don't choose an AION. So, well, disc hemorrhages are relatively more uncommon, and a lot of disc hemorrhages are really uncommon in AION. So um, they'll probably show you like a swollen nerve with some hemorrhages or cotton wool spots, and then you should be thinking GCA. Um, and then you want to check the ESR CRP. You need to get a TA biopsy, no matter what the ESR CRP is. But if if they're presenting a story that sounds really symptomatic for GCA, right? So you want to get the ESR CRP, start them on steroids, and then get the TA biopsy, even if the ESR CRP is. Okay, papilledema, uh, you know, is disc swelling that is specifically related to increased intracranial pressure. So it's bilateral, it might be kind of asymmetric, but usually both, both nerves. Um, they have preserved visual function until the disc swelling is severe. So if you have a pretty swollen nerve and then the visual field that they show you is just enlarged blind spots, um, they're going down a papilledema route. Uh, so the typical headaches, I mean typical symptom, obviously headache, transient visual obscuration, so um, dim outs, blackouts, gray outs when they change position for a few seconds, pulse synchronous tinnitus, hearing the heartbeat in the ears. Uh, you can get a six nerve palsy if the pressure gets high enough. Uh, they usually don't have vision loss until it's advanced. So causes of increased intracranial pressure, the workup that you do if you're suspecting that, you have to do the MRI brain because you can have increased intracranial pressure with a big tumor or meningitis or like the meningeal carcinomatosis. You have to do the MRV to rule out venous sinus thrombosis, especially if they're telling you a picture about a woman on like oral contraceptives. Um, pseudotumor cerebri is the other sort of umbrella term for um, you know, increased intracranial pressure, not from one of those other issues. So it can be sleep apnea induced. That's going to be, that hasn't really been tested, I don't think, that much previously, like the association, but it will be eventually. They'll, they'll catch up with it and start asking questions about that. Um, of course, everybody knows the medication induced stuff. Uh, just remember that IH is a diagnosis of exclusion, so you need to have a normal MRI, MRV, and the CSF study. So obviously, you we want to have an elevated opening pressure on LP, but otherwise it should be normal. Um, so, you yeah, know, everybody knows the picture for IH, right? It's a young woman, she's gained weight or she's overweight. Um, if it's a younger kid, they won't necessarily fit that picture. But the treatment is <coughs> weight loss and headache treatment. Um, if there's no disc edema or if the disc edema is mild, relatively mild, and there's no vision loss. Um, you add in acetazolamide, or you know, there's other medications that can be used too, like 
um, furosemide and topamax, but if I ask about acetazolamide, if there's vision loss and, you know, aka disc edema. For advanced or fulminant cases, you do surgical intervention with a nerve sheath fenestration or outpatient. Uh, okay, so optic neuritis, um, if, they're, if they're giving you a question about optic neuritis, you really in your mind want to decide when you're reading it, like, are they presenting a typical optic neuritis or an atypical optic neuritis? So the typical optic neuritis is a younger patient, it's usually unilateral, 92% of the time they'll have pain with eye movements, um, an afferent pupillary defect, and disc edema, like relatively mild disc edema, in about a third. So if it's atypical optic neuritis, like if it's bilateral, if there are hemorrhages, if it's severe disc swelling, if it's severe vision loss, if there's no pain, um, then it's a little bit of a different approach and it's gonna be kind of a different answer to the questions, right? So if it's typical, then the results of the optic neuritis treatment trial do apply. And really the only workup that you need really is the MRI. If it's atypical, those um, the study results really don't apply and you have to rule out other systemic conditions with a bigger workup. you will definitely get a question about the optic neuritis treatment trial. Um, so the objective of the study was to try to decide what the role of steroids should be in the treatment of acute unilateral optic neuritis. Um, the, the study showed that IV steroids will result in a faster recovery, that, that's the protocol that they used. Um, it doesn't result in more recovery after a year. IV steroids do not reduce the rate of additional attacks of optic neuritis, nor did it reduce the incidence of MS at three years compared to placebo. It did slightly reduce the incidence of the development of MS at two years, um, but by three years, it was the same. So you always consider treating optic neuritis with IV steroids, but you don't have to. You don't want to do oral prednisone because there's a higher risk of relapse um, compared to the IV steroids. So those are the things. And then uh, the optic neuritis treatment trial also kind of showed or proved why you have to do an MRI in everybody and it's to risk stratify them for the development of MS. So um, by 15 years after the optic neuritis episode, if they had no periventricular white matter lesions, 25% went on to develop MS. If they had one or more lesion, about 75% went on to develop MS. So they're definitely going to ask you one, a question about this. Um, NMO is going to probably be more asked about more and more um, over the next few years because so much more is being learned about it over time. Um, but you know, it's, the, it's an autoimmune condition that results in primarily demyelination of the uh, optic nerve and spinal cord, but you can hit the brain stem as well. And there is the particular autoantibody, the IgG against aquaporin 4 water channel membrane protein um, in the oligodendrocytes. So this is some updated criteria about diagnosing it uh, because you can make the diagnosis with or without positive antibodies. So I would be uh, basically familiar with um, what you need to diagnose it. So there's the transverse myelitis. You also want to think about um, NMO if they describe an area post syndrome where somebody has intractable hiccups uh, and vomiting. <laughs> All right, so um, third nerve palsy can be, you know, it can happen anywhere along the track. It's rare to have a nuclear third nerve palsy, but there's some really particular findings, so you want to be basically familiar with it. If they get a nuclear third nerve palsy, they're going to have bilateral ptosis and contralateral superior rectus paresis, in addition to, like, the typical. Um, the pupil involvement will either be both eyes or neither eye.
because the edinger westfall nucleus is going to supply both pupils. There are the um, fascicle syndromes, which, like, I, you know, you learn every year and forget every year, and I, I still don't know, and I don't know if, I can't remember if I ever actually had a question on it, so I don't know how worth it it is to know those, but um, if there is an associated fourth, fifth, sixth nerve palsy or Horner's, make sure you're thinking about the cavernous sinus. 95% of the time, if it's a compressive etiology, uh, the pupil will be involved, but 20% of the time, it's spared initially and then goes on to become involved. 80% um, of the time, an ischemic or microvascular third nerve palsy will spare the pupil because the pupil fibers are um, running on the outside, right? So if you have a compressive external thing smooshing on it, then it's more likely to be involved. Um, whereas the ischemic stuff, the, the blood supply is more interior. So, um, If it's microvascular, it will get better in three to six months. It's all, I don't know if, I don't know if they'll ask specifically, like, do you have to get an MRI, MRA in an ischemic? So if they're presenting a picture where it's a complete third nerve palsy, but pupil sparing, um, then they're going down the ischemic microvascular route. Um, it's important to note that if it's a partial <coughs> third nerve palsy and pupil sparing, that is not a microvascular picture. Like in real life, it can be that way, but on the test, it has to be a complete third nerve palsy and pupil sparing for it to be considered like a typical microvascular picture. But um, you don't have to get an MRI, MRA in that particular setting, but you do have to see that really, really frequently for like several weeks, like daily or every other day or something, um, because 20% of the compressive etiologies will start out as pupil sparing, right? So um, it'd be hard to go wrong with choosing the answer of like that you have to work it up with an MRI, MRA. And then the other thing is that if the MRI, MRA is negative, then you have to get a cerebral angiogram. That's another one where the, in the real world, that's not really what we do, but on the test, that's the right answer. If it's negative, you must get a cerebral angiogram. And then you always, always, always want to think about GCA because sometimes it'll present that way. Um, myasthenia gravis may present with a third nerve palsy mimic, but it won't involve the pupil. Uh, aberrant regeneration of the third nerve, you can have three different types muscle to muscle, muscle to pupil, where the pupil constricts um, on either down gaze or adduction, or muscle to lid, where the lid retracts when they move the eye. So you want to look for that because um, aberrant regeneration is never seen with a microvascular third nerve palsy. So um, if someone has aberrant regeneration from that, it, it's either from a tumor, aneurysm, or some other compressive cause or trauma. Uh, the fourth nerve palsy is the only one that decusades and it exits the dorsal brainstem, which is why it's the most common cranial nerve palsy in head trauma. Um, in a congenital fourth nerve palsy, they'll have increased vertical fusional amplitudes. If it's long standing, they'll have probably like three or more diopters of vertical fusional amplitude. If it's congenital, it'll be like 10 to 15. Uh, if it's a bilateral fourth nerve palsy, the right eye, they have the crossed vertical strabismus where the right eye is higher in left gaze, left eye is higher in right gaze, and um, more than 10 degrees of X cyclotorsion with a double Maddox rod. They may also try to show you a fourth nerve palsy by showing you a fundus photo with X cyclotorsion. So think about that. Um, if they show you a picture like that, they're talking about the fourth nerve. The three-step test, I, I have never had a question about a three-step test that wasn't a fourth nerve palsy. Now, I mean, you know, they could ask it, but I, it's always a fourth nerve palsy. Um, and I think that's primarily because the three-step test actually has relatively limited use. Um, like, it's helpful in the fourth nerve palsy, but other than that, most of the time, there's more than one muscle that's involved, like, in any type of restrictive strabismus or whatever. So I don't know. It, 
like you'd have to prove to yourself that it's that it's not a fourth nerve palsy if they ask you about the Parks Wilkowski test. Uh, sixth nerve palsy. So remember that um, the sixth nerve exits the you know front side of the pons next to the cerebellopontine angle where the seventh and eighth nerve is. Um, then it climbs up over the clivus, goes through Drell's canal, in through the cavernous sinus, and through the superior orbital fissure. Um, and that area where it goes through Drell's canal is adjacent to the petrous bone. So if they get a petrous apocytis, like a kid who gets um, mastoiditis after like inner ear infections, uh, they can get a gratinigo syndrome with six, seventh nerve palsy and decreased hearing. Uh, microvascular is the most common um, type of six nerve palsy, especially if it's an older person. So you don't have to image them unless it hasn't gotten better after three months, but they do need to be evaluated by the primary care or you know, just evaluated for microvascular risk factors. Um, there are a lot of mimics of a six nerve palsy um, to be aware of. If the person that they're describing is younger than 50, they must have a workup with an MRI and an LP. Kids can get a post-viral six nerve palsy, but um, they, they will need a workup if it's less than 50. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia, so they cannot adduct the ipsilateral eye um, and they get abduction nystagmus in the fellow eye. Um, it's a lesion of the medial longitudinal fasciculus. If they're still able to converge, then it's anterior, like in the midbrain. If they don't have convergence, it's posterior in the pons. If it's a young patient, it's a demyelinative picture. If it's an older patient, it's going to be a stroke picture. But Mycenae gravis and Miller Fisher can mimic it, including like with the nystagmus in lateral gaze. So keep that in mind. This is a picture of a midbrain INL. So this is DWI, um, but I'm just trying to show you where it is. If it's in the pons, it's going to be a little bit more dorsal. So, you know, kind of like in that area of the pons there. But that's another one that's so easy to ask because it's so localizing. So I would definitely know that. Um, CPEO, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, is an inherited mitochondrial myopathy, um, which can be inherited either through the maternal mitochondrial DNA, autosomal, or sporadic. So you get slowly progressive, <coughs> symmetric, lack of movement of the eyes, usually with ptosis, sometimes without. Um, it can be, oh, the, you can have a nuclear DNA mutation that drives a mitochondrial like, protein issue. So it can be either nuclear or mitochondrial in nature. Um, so this is the picture, uh, uh, you know, diagram showing representative findings. So this is what it looks like, ptosis. They, they usually have a little bit of a chin up position and they're gonna have symmetric ophthalmoplegia to varying degrees. Uh, so because of that, they're usually not diplopic. Um, but they do have a hard time reading um, and they're bothered by the ptosis. That's usually like, about it in terms of the visual complaints. They're not usually that bothered by the lack of eye movement. Um, and then some people have generalized proximal muscle weakness. So in order to diagnose it, you can do genetic testing and you get a muscle biopsy looking for the ragged red fiber. So this is the Camori trichrome stain um, in a current sayer. So this, you definitely have to know, Kern-Sayer is the syndrome that's associated with CPEO um, and the cardiac conduction abnormalities can kill them. Does anybody know what the finding is in EKG? Like, what are you actually looking for? Prolonged PR, they get heart block. Um, and, but everybody with CPEO should have a hearing test, an EKG, and an LP. This I thought was kind of helpful. I'm not going to go into like thyroid eye stuff because I think it'll be covered well elsewhere. But um, I thought it was a helpful thing to show. What, yeah, what does it look like if it's tendon involving versus tendon sparing? 
Um, so this is the tendon involved, tendon involving, and tendon sparing. So thyroid orbitopathy is tendon sparing. Myositis is not. Um, okay, these are some of Anna's slides. Like, it's too much. It's too much to go over. But uh, so atystonic pupil is generally. Um, idiopathic and we don't really know why it involves um, loss of innervation through the short posterior ciliary nerves and the ciliary ganglion. That's usually unilateral initially, but um, a significant number becomes bilateral. It's usually a woman and she's younger and she'll have a big pupil that doesn't respond well to light, but it uh, responds better um, to accommodative effort. And the pupil will sometimes get small over time. That's the little old 80s. Um, and they, they have loss of accommodation that usually gets better on its own. When you look at them under the slit lamp, you look for the verbiform movements of the iris. Uh, why do they get the light near dissociation? Because 90% of the fibers are innervating the ciliary body, 3% are doing the iris sphincter, so they actually get aberrant regeneration of the iris sphincter by those remaining ciliary body fibers. Um, that gives you the slow near reflex. So usually you don't have to work it up, but if they present with kind of acute bilateral 80s, um, think about other causes. Usually it's going to be like a simplest question. Um, etiologies of light nerve dissociation, you do want to be just kind of generally familiar with it. Uh, yeah, so you do have to know the localizing um, types of nystagmus. They're, they'll probably ask you about, if they're going to ask you about one, it's probably downbeat, and then the next most common is probably seesaw or obstaclonus. So downbeat nystagmus, you you want to know that it is pathology at the cervical medullary junction, but also um, medication induced like lithium and some of the other anti-seizure medications. Um, Obstaclonus can be perineoplastic, you want to know that. And neuroblastoma, you're going to cover this elsewhere too, but um, if they talk about a kid that has sudden onset proptosis or eyelid swelling or eyelid bruising, especially if they're describing any type of nystagmus picture, then it should immediately make you think of neuroblastoma. Um, and they may have murders with it, but uh, you diagnose it with looking for catecholamines in the urine, you can biopsy it, uh, mean age of presentation is two. Histopathological features of metastatic neuroblastoma to the orbit. So the Homer right rosettes are the um, typical thing, unless it's metastatic, and then they may not be as differentiated. These are the poor prognostic factors in neuroblastoma. Okay, that's it. Does anybody have any questions?